So why are we here? Well, thank you very much uh, for UCL to create this uh, fantastic program to get uh, industry and academia to start really sort of exploring how we can really make a difference. We know that um, the impact of our building industry is huge regarding the carbon emissions of the world. And so what are we going to do about it? How can we confront the climate change and reshape a better world? So how do we confront and share better world? By, what I mean by better world has got to be one where its, it's inhabitants are safer, healthier, have better access to amenity and live in the inspirational surroundings while being affordable and sustainable. And there have been a number of framework agreements over the years. Our common future in the late 80s, whenever it was first started um, in, in my career, advocating the growth of human progress through economic development without bankrupting the natural resources for the future generations. And then today we have the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. These goals formulate a vision for 2030, which 193 nations globally have signed up to since 2015. The UN SDGs is a means to ensure prosperity for all, end poverty and protect our planet. And lighting can play a significant role in many of these goals, set from ensuring good health and well-being to building resilience in cities and communities whilst tackling climate change. And here's just a selection of some project examples from hospitals, schools, public realm, to media facade work, offices, how we repurpose disused underground facilities, creating rainforest greenhouse for scientific institution, to forming consortium and partnership with academia and the industry and the public bodies to try to find a solution, a way forward. And sustainable development is fundamentally about creating a balance between the needs of a growing world population and the health of our planet, and it is a balancing act. As professionals of the built environment, we play a critical role in moderating and mediating this delicate balance. Good design is vital in achieving the UN SDGs, and here's how the goals translate to what we must do as lighting professionals for the built environment. From what we heard yesterday, we confronted climate change. The conversations and actions we need must go beyond reductions of energy and carbon, but more moving towards the restorative and regenerative design. And regenerative design is a development that not, not only operates within the planetary boundaries, but actually reverse our environmental impact over the years. It is not about doing less harm, but instead focus on doing even more good so like what I'm showing here is how you really balance the side from the human perspective to the, the planetary boundaries, but also is the transition of what we can do as industry in the built industry, the transition of the zero carbon and uh, the economy principles. So to accelerate this change, we need a gear shift and learn fast, focusing on three principles that I'm going to talk through like uh, today, the human perspective, how we cohabitate, this earth with nature and also circular design. What can we do differently? So the first principle fundamentally it is about building the right thing. From human perspective, as defined by WHO, health is not only the physical state of individuals, rather it's a state of complete physical, psychological and social well-being. And light is fundamental to our social infrastructure as Lighting professional, our work impact people and the environment. Putting human-centric thinking approach at the heart of our design is a key first principle. So we need to constantly learn, ask ourselves, how can we actually improve our knowledge in doing what we do to create an environment that is more than just functional, but socially useful both day and night. And of course, design with daylight is the first thing we sort of looked at. And we know that daylight is the best light and it is free. It's a no-brainer. But the world is changing. Urbanization has been, has been a global phenomenon. So with densification of cities, access to daylight can become more challenging, which also impact the health besides the island effect that we heard yesterday. And it goes without saying that we also see buildings being built with much, much deeper floor plans. 
So with people now spending 90% of their time indoor, there's a necessity to light the building well. And the Well Building Institute has also recognized that that's been dedicating some of these of design features on daylight and circadian lighting. But lighting well doesn't mean lighting too well. And of course, we've seen in the industry that some people are thinking about you know, the, the way to approach circadian lighting or the lighting for well-being is just change the color of the light, warm to cool, to warm again in the evening. But really, I would advocate that whenever we're trying to do something different, we should really think about what can we learn from the natural world? There's so much we can learn from the nature. So what instead we've been thinking is how about sending indoor lighting, not something that we artificially create as something we thought about, but also look at what the nature in real time is like. So last year we created a, a pilot research project we did at Arab. And we've built ourselves an IoT spectrometer and place it on top of the roof of a building to capture the real-time data of daylight. And then both intensity as well as the spectral power distributions. And then pushing these data to the cloud and then using these to inform and tune the spectral profile of the indoor lighting. This pur the purpose of this study is to get a, a much deeper insight as to understand the non-visual benefits of daylight through electric lighting in terms of cognitive performance, alertness, and mood. While the study gave a good insight into what we set out to explore and to, to find out, it also raises the questions about the artificial tunable profile of the lights during the afternoon hours. The left-hand graph is pretty much showing what the industry trends has been, as opposed to what we actually find out um, and what's actually happened to, to the daylight in nature. And rather than the, just randomly reducing the color temperature of indoor lighting towards the afternoon. It's the question is, should the CCT, which is the color temperature, be in sync with the actual daylight and be a subject to the seasonal or the weather condition change? This is quite a fundamental question because it does affect the efficiency of the light, the efficacy of light, but also what we want to explore, this is sort of something that we want to explore more in the future on live project as well as in more through the research. What about after dark? How about cities after dark? Now with cities shifting towards the 24 hours, we know that cities that work for people need to operate as a complex adaptive system, which you heard also yesterday in the lectures. And we see cities in the daytime, but then the same city at night, do we take it for granted that light can be as simple as just switching on the street light and, and, and that's it? Um, we should sort of really think about how light can really shape our experience and our behavior after dark. It could be quite different from during the daytime. And we have seen there's been huge investments that have gone into cities to reduce carbon. And many of these actions that the cities have taken is through adoption of LED technology. And they see that as being the holy grail. But are we missing opportunities? So over the last few years, at Arab, we have set out a program of applied research activities to explore and promote an integrated approach for sustainable lighting. How can light lighting positively impact the total architecture of our cities, reinforcing the urban design principles, enhancing cultural experiences, and also encouraging social interaction? And here are some of the publications that you can download from our website. Uh, one to the left is the latest one which we launched most recently. And that's a, a response to the pandemic, because the pandemic has brought to us some unprecedented challenges, both for people and society. Our ways of working, living and interaction are also changing after dark. So how can lighting be a solution for town centres economic recovery? As the nights begin to draw in, in part of the northern hemisphere, and with more people accessing the cities, city centres, towns, by walking and cycling, how can lighting help cities and towns to continue trading and functioning throughout the winter months, throughout the night. So capitalizing on an increased desire to walk and cycle in lieu of the public transport will require an improved perception of safety after dark and all these routes to encourage their use. So in the latest report we set out some with the local governments of how to rethink the value of urban lighting as a solution also for the economic recovery, as well as improving the quality of life of citizens, both during and post pandemic. 
from enhancing the heritage buildings, repurposing some of the underused access, could be so under the underpass, to encouraging a greater sense of community and bringing people closer to the nature. We must put forward, and we have been putting forward the nine challenges that town would normally face, but lighting can be used as a tool to actually create a practical solution and help to regenerate our town centers and moving towards more a sustainable development goals. And how we conclude the report is also a guidance of developing a comprehensive lighting strategy to meet the town's objectives for regeneration. So any, I think any solution we put forward as a sort of sustainable angle, low carbon, working towards zero carbon, it has to work with people. Otherwise it could be just a waste. So what about the nature? The second principle to consider is the cohabitation with nature. And it is more than about mitigating light pollution and so wasting less energy. And to start with, we need to be respectful towards the nocturnal animals and understanding that the use of artificial light will impact them. So we need to use that more responsibility, with more responsibility in order to prevent the nocturnal life disturbance. So this just will give you an example of a project that we've looked at um, before. So how a lighting professional actually equipped ourselves to find resolution to something like this? There was a, quite some years ago when we were asked to look at what are the impacts of an offshore gas production plant could have on marine life. So the question could then lead into, would the color and the brightness of the flame disorientate, for example, the turtles in their mating season when they're migrating? So we have to look beyond our own discipline and be inquisitive enough to find out which are the other field of expertise that we need to engage with so that we can translate the problem into something that together we can work out what the solution is. And it's not just about the, the nighttime that impact the, the e ecology uh, life, but it could be daytime as well. For example, this is a question like, is it technically possible to deliver a covered river corridor for infrastructure project, which can maximize the potential for ecological connections? And in this case, the concerns about this project is about the habitat connectivity of fishes that is in the waterway and other key species in the water that is a part of the local ecosystem. And by covering the, the waterway and covering the daylight, how could how could we avoid and mitigate the impact of making this connect connectivity stay as what they are and uh, what is needed to ensure the movement of fish? Because there's no point of just, the fish probably don't need the daylight to see, but the food would attract the fish to move in a certain way. So these are things that we need to sort of really start sort of thinking about out of the box. So addressing questions that we don't know and how we can find out and, and find this sort of answer from that from looking at baseline decoding what does light mean for fish or other species in the water to actually setting up laboratory tests to actually set up controlled experiment that we can actually find the answer so that we will know how we can actually mitigate those issues and problems. And then finally, the third principle is about adopting the circular design approach. Transitioning to zero carbon, we're not talking just about in operation, but also we need to consider, start considering the whole life cycle and body carbon that as the lighting design from our point of view are the lighting products. So from the perspective of lighting product life cycle, this is what applying a circular principle might look like. As designers, we design a product and then the manufacturer produce it, distribute it and use it. And finally, identify ways to keep it in circulation. And you thought that it might be mostly in the industry, in the manufacturer's realm of responsibility and they can take care of it all. Um, but the real approach to circular is, is not just about producing a product, it's thinking about how that can be reused, maybe repaired and also refurbished for a second use or the third use. And the recycling itself should be really the last resort. So how does adopting a, a circular economy mean for us as designers, lighting designers, engineers for built environment? How does it impact lighting design of buildings? And we came up with this, where the outer circle of this diagram shows a life cycle of a built environment. And the first step is we as designers, engineers, we conceptualize and build the built environment where we make the design, specify them in our projects, have them installed and then commission them. 
So now the question is, are we adopting the fundamental circular principles and approach when we do all these? And then once the building is ready, we then move in and use the lighting system during operations. And when the building has reached the end of life, then we think about returning all these materials back into circulation. And this inner circle is the why the lighting considerations of visual or non-visual needs of people play a huge part in during all these three stages shown in the outer loop. So it, we need to sort of really have this sort of design thinking right at the beginning of the project. How we design the lighting for our building will have a great impact on whether we could keep the system in the sort of circular mode, the circularity of the system several years later. And adopting and practicing circular design, we should sort of really think about how that aligns with the RBA stages that we are designing to as professionals. So now to conclude, let's refresh how these visual and non-visual needs are satisfied from the lighting systems. First and foremost is the amount of light. Of course, we need to adequately illuminate our buildings and, and places, but are we lighting them to the right levels? Are we using too much light just because LEDs make it possible while still complying with the energy code? Are we truly pushing ourselves to state the importance of darkness? Are we questioning because the standards in the right place at the right time? And are we using the are we doing the best we can in order to responsibly consume our lumens? So this is fundamentally what we do as lighting engineers and designers. And the next bit is about the contrast. This is quite linked, very much linked to the amount of light that we use in the space. And how do we balance that? How do we vary them? And sometimes less is more. Are we actually better in drawing attention to certain focal points by differentiating brightness than lighting everything to the brightest possible? And then the third point is about the color, the quality of the light source that allowed good quality appearance of the objects, the finishes, the materials, all those are very important. And the higher quality of source also means that it lasts longer and also remains usable for a longer time. And then number four is using the right luminous in the right place, using the right optics so that we actually create the right impact, the best impact we want from the lighting. And as design professionals, we also need to decide how we really want to shine the light onto what to maximize this sort of visual benefit. And this is where the sort of professional we bring in. And, and then anything when we talk about light design, how can we not talk about daylight? And this must be the, the, this is the best light, but also the first things we really need to think about uh, for the outcome of health and well-being for the building occupants to make sure that in the end, we are creating a much more longer term valuable assets, the build asset itself, because in time you can change the light fitting, but what you can't change the building, if you want to sort of repurpose the building for reselling it or reletting it, you, what's built in from a lighting perspective is the daylight, how daylight is being brought into the building. So this is, must be a most, most important part to set the building into the right track for being reused, refurbished, retrofitting or other new purpose. And then finally, um, to get all these good lighting designs and manifest it through the building use, the importance of smart controls, not just about energy saving, that's very important, how to link to the occupancy and actual daylight itself, but more of making sure that the lighting is more in sync of how the building, the spaces are being used by people, how we can allow um, a, a good degree of personalization of the lighting to the individual needing to use them, how to have a feedback also into the building monitoring systems um, so that it can be optimized on how it's being used over the time and also using maybe AI machine learning to actually anticipate how buildings uh, need to be prepared for its occupants as well. And perhaps even think about go wireless so that so we can even further re reduce the footprint of the design. So what I've done here today is in a talk is actually going around during the circular part is coming saying, lighting needs to be done for humanity and and that's why it's we, we need to address the carbon we need to address the, the the climate change that we are facing and but it's a, a kind of double edge as well that's um that is the the tackling the climate change side of what we can do as a sort of minimal to affect the change but also we need to sort of design uh, for the change climate as well and and how we can prepare people to be more resilient 
in dealing with that. And the whole thing, when it's health and well-being, to building community resilience, to work designing within the boundary, to actually within our control as lighting designs, whether we engage with products and questioning how we design, how we go about design, design to what is really needed rather than just over, over designing. It is all very important. So thank you very much at the end of the talk.